talking about Lucas Clumber and Drakensberg Rock Art and the managing of, uh, of this rock art, primarily over the last 10 years. And uh, we're going from the South Downs or Southern England to South Africa, so quite a, quite a way we're moving, we're moving south. Uh, let's go. That's a lot moving. Okay, so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to the Lucas Clumber Drakensberg, what it looks like the rock art and the loss of rock art that we've experienced over a period of time, some of the management arrangements in the park. Uh, I'm going to look at an organization called Ezembelo and make some points about it. It's the management authority uh, for the Ukaklamba for the Drakensberg Park. I'm going to talk about its priorities and then I'm going to move on to some recent sort of developments in management, some positives, some negatives. And then I'm going to come back to the Ezembelo and the Natel Parks Board, which was a, a forerunner of, of Ezembelo, to try and understand some of the priorities and the impact that this has on the management of the rock art, and then I'm going to wrap up. So, I suppose uh, some of you might, South Africa, you'll know where South Africa is. The uh, Kaklamba Drakensberg is in the eastern part of South Africa, uh, it's in this area over here. It's a mountainous area that borders on, uh, on, uh, on Lesotho. So this is a, a, you can see that it's a mountainous area. Uh, the Okaklamba Drakensberg is down that side and it abuts the mountain kingdom of Lesotho which is to the west of it. And this is in the eastern part of South Africa. As I mentioned, it's a mountainous area. So what you have here is the high mountains and the low mountains. The majority of the rock art is in the low, what we call the low berg, the low Drakensberg, uh, in rock, uh, cave sandstone rock shelters. Very few uh, caves in the, or shelters in the higher mountains. There are some, and some do have paintings in them, but the vast majority is down in the, in the bottom, in rock shelters, uh, at the bottom of these uh, sandstone bands, primarily you can see it over there, broken up into two, the higher berg and the, the lower berg, and the rock shelters down at the bottom. We do occasionally get uh, boulders coming away from these sandstone bands and falling in such a way that they create rock shelters that people both lived in and uh, made paintings in it as well. Um, oh, over the, the paintings have been recorded or documented over a very long period of time, so, since the 1870s, but really mostly in the last 50, 60 years. There's been a lot of projects recording the paintings. We now know that there are over 600 painted sites in this area, and we have probably on record over 40,000 images. So there's a lot of images in these sites, primarily humans, 60%, animals about 30%. So about 90% of the paintings are humans and uh, with equipment and animals. We also have separate uh, ritual figures and then other sort of uh, pieces of equipment and lines separated uh, from humans. It's a World Heritage Site. In fact, it became South Africa's fourth <coughs> World Heritage Site in the year 2000. Um, the four criteria, it's a mixed World Heritage Site, so it's a natural and cultural uh, World Heritage Site. And the two cultural criteria are one that's uh, and I'll, mention, I'll come back to the word Maluti later, but it's the largest and most concentrated group of rock paintings in Africa, south of the Sahara. It is outstanding both in terms of its quality and diversity of subject matter. That's the first criterion. And the second is that the sand people, these are hunter-gatherer people, lived in the mountains for more than four millennia, leaving behind them a corpus of outstanding rock art, uh, providing unique testimony which throws much light on their way of life and their beliefs. So it's, uh, that gives you a sense of, 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 of the importance. can be added to, it's, uh, not only is it uh, very rich, but it's one of the best recorded and interpreted rock art regions in South Africa, and in fact Africa as a whole. And it's been used certainly lot over the last 40, 50 years as the basis for very significant interpretation, uh, advances in interpretation of rock art uh, in South Africa. But as the third point uh, makes, it's, also, it's been used, these, these understandings that have been developed based on ethnography, but uh, applied, the ethnography applied to, to the rock art in the Ukaklamba Drakensberg has, has then been used in other parts of the world as well. The Upper Paleolithic rock art has benefited from interpretation 
which was uh, developed in the Drakensberg or the Kuchlampe Drakensberg and even Neolithic passage grave art. So it's really, it's had significance way beyond just the, the Kuchlampe Drakensberg. And it's a magnificent art. I, um, it's well known primarily for the shaded polychromes, so that's in the Kuchlampe Drakensberg and surrounding areas, and you can see you can see these uh, shaded polychromes over here, so three colors or more that shade into each other. Uh, the large animals that you're seeing are earlunt, and those are the largest antelope, and uh, they were seen by the hunter-gatherers having a lot of power. You can see human figures as well. These large sort of human-like figures are what we call therianthropes, so they're half human, half animal figures. I could spend, in fact, the next half an hour just talking about them, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you some pictures to give you a sense of what these are about. Um, this has got to be one of my most favorite sites. It's called Yelan Cave. Uh, in the 60s, a man called Harold Pog recorded over 1,600 paintings in the site. Uh, a beautiful site, really uh, very impressive. Uh, they spoke about the, the detail in the rock art. You can see some of it over there. <coughs> what am I going to do? Could you turn off the lights over there? Because... Yes, yes. Which one is it? This one, I think it turns yes, off. Down our own, yeah. Yeah. There, you can, you can see the, the quality of the art. And, and you can, it's fantastic. Uh, and this is one of my favorite scenes. It's an earlunt. It's a large figure. You can just see the front of the face and a pangolin sniffing each other. Uh, it's the only kind of, uh, painting of its kind that I know from this, from this area. Now my association with these paintings goes back, what, 35, 30, well, 35, 37, what, 30, what 2017, 38 years. So in 1979, as a young postgraduate from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, I was given the job uh, for two and a half, or two and a quarter years, to survey as many paintings and sites as I could in the Uchaklambe Drakensberg. And, then the, and the reason to do this was to bring together all the different recordings that had been done uh, over the, what, the previous 20, 30 years to standardize these, but also use as a basis of developing a management plan, because at that point there was no management as such in the, in the Uchaklambe Drakensberg. I started in 79, and it went through to March 1981. So I was well into the project when I visited this site in, uh, on the 19th of August 1980. It's called Good Hope One. And I knew from a, a book published by Patricia Winnicombe that the paintings had uh, significantly deteriorated since 1907 when they were first, uh, first recorded through, through photography. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't ready for what I experienced next. So the top left, 1907. Uh, a photograph, and then the bottom right and top right are redrawings by uh, Patricia Winnicom, 1958 and 1968. And then the bottom right is 2009, and that's really what I experienced in 1980, that they were gone. The paintings had completely disappeared. What had happened was, you can see between 1907 and 1958, there's quite a bit of deterioration, but the, the, the paintings you can still see, they're more or less intact. It was put onto a uh, local hotel walk list in the early 1960s, and then the deterioration just accelerated. People coming in, touching the paintings, putting watch on the paintings. So much so that by the time I walked into it in August uh, 1980, it was gone completely. And in fact, uh, what we've had, a project by uh, Justine and uh, Vinci's and, and Jeff Guy, where they have digitally, you know, uh, They've digitally restored it, so the painting, so you can, you can look at it through a publication, but it's, it's not there anymore. And as I said, they were able to locate the original position of the paintings, or the painting, although the painting images themselves had ostensibly disappeared. And what was really interesting for me at that time in 1980, there was another site about 300 meters away, 300 meters away, Good Hope 2, which had no damage in it at all. So the, the nature of the impact of just people engage, engaging with the site, because very few people visited Good Hope too, was evident in this, in this site. And it, 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 it was a, a seminal lesson, lesson to me at the time of the vulnerability of the paintings. And it wasn't necessarily through overt vandalism. It was through people just engaging, touching it, putting water on it to try and bring out the colors, kicking up dust. And these are very vulnerable things that we know uh, with archeology span that once they lost, they lost forever. These are not, and these are arguments 
I would have with natural scientists. You can't reintroduce the paintings in the way you can introduce Irland and other antelope. So that was a, a seminal lesson to me in, at that time. And this loss is ongoing. So what a, a project in the, in the early, late 60s, early 70s showed in, a, in the Dima Gorge in the northern Drakensberg that there were losses of the paintings. And that was in part that informed the creation of the project that I did. But more recently, a man called Tommy Top, along with some volunteers, have gone back. They've looked at my field work from 79 and 80. And they indicate that there's been a loss of nearly 32% of the paintings in 30 years. Now, I can't be absolutely certain if that is the case. But whatever the, the situation, if it's 20% or 30%, we are losing these paintings. They are vulnerable and they are going. So we, we know that. And they've listed why they believe that to be the case. So in the Uckerklamba Drakensberg, it's, a, 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 it's not a national park, it's a provincial park. And the management authority for the World Heritage Site, which was determined by the minister, is Ezembelo, so the KwaZulu Natal Wildlife Organization, which is an organization that was formed post apartheid in 1998, bringing together two, uh, two uh, organizations together one, the Natal Parks Board, and the other one, the KwaZulu Directorate of Nature Conservation. The management in the, in the park should be guided by an integrated management plan, and that's in accordance with South African legislation. Ezembelo, uh, at the time, of the creation of the World Heritage Site in two or the designation of the World Heritage Site, didn't have a, uh, a cultural heritage specialist. So they t uh, developed a memorandum of understanding with an organization called Amafa Aquazulu Natali, which is the provincial heritage organization. And that committed both parties to cultural resources, conservation, and various other things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Ezenvelo is the management authority, and ha they have the responsibility for the, for the paintings. Um, in 2013, a, piece, a, a park in Lesotho called Seshlaba Tebi was joined to the, to the World Heritage Site, so it became a transfrontier park, and it, it changed, its name changed to the Meloti Drakensberg Transfrontier Park. I'm not going to read through the purposes, but just if you look at point two, it's to protect the outstanding universal values, and two of those were cultural values. And if you go down a couple of extra points, it talks about preserving and conserving the ecological and cultural integrity of the area. And the point below that talks about safeguarding the historical and the archaeological uh, and living, cultu living, cu uh, living cultural heritage as well. So you can see there's a very strong remit within that to safeguard the cultural and the archaeological values. But if you look at it as in Velo, as an organization, their focus is very much on biodiversity, on the environment. So I'm not going to read through these other than the vision to be a world-renowned leader in the field of biodiversity management. And this gets uh, shown all over the place. So they have these banners. In fact, I photographed this banner in their boardroom about uh, two, three weeks ago. And they, they get taken out to show. So if you, think of, if you ask the general public if they know about Ezenvelo, they will tell you that their remit, the remit of that organization, is, is biodiversity conservation. And if you look at their website in terms of conservation planning, it's all about biodiversity. There's nothing about cultural and archaeological matters. Despite Ezenvela's focus on biodiversity and the natural environment, rock art management efforts have continued during the last decade, the last 10 or so years, and I'm going to be focusing on that period of time. And that's been primarily led by AMAFA, the heritage agency in the province, supported by NGOs non or charity organizations, as you would call them here, and private individuals. So we have something called the African Conservation Trust that ran a mapping project of the Drakensberg and supported by Tommy Top, a, a private individual. So they've, they've done that. And some of the positives that have come out of their work over the last 10 years is one that they've and probably the most important is that they've, uh, they've comprehensively updated and, in fact, found a whole lot of new sites of, uh, for the first time since the 1970s and 1980s. So we now have a, an updated uh, list of rock art sites, their contents and images and GPS readings of all these sites, which obviously we never had in the late 70s and early 80s. They've updated the recommendations about the monitoring of the individual sites 
They've recommended a cluster monitoring approach where sites are monitoring, monitored uh, together, which apparently has been implemented by Isenvelo. They've had programs of uh, site interventions through the removal of graffiti, the installation of drip lines. That's all taken place. They've updated management plans for public, publicly accessible sites, so there are 26 of these in the Oklahoma Drakensberg itself and 16 in the World Heritage Buffer Zone. And there have been various initiatives around working with the community. And you can see a post on the right there, which has been produced by MAFA. But these achievements have been, have been made without the benefit of a functioning management plan. The last management plan for the cultural heritage goes back to 2008. And by the time the, the new mapping project was completed in 2012, so about four years on, into, that, uh, uh, into that management plan, the old management plan could by that stage be considered to be out of date, to be redundant, and it hasn't been updated since then. So it's five years on, and it's not been updated, although I believe there are efforts in the way, uh, underway to update it. There are some blind spots as well in terms of the management. So here we know there have been heritage science projects in the Ukaklamba Drakensberg since the mid-1990s, but no one in, in AMAFA or in the management uh, of Ezenved or generally have engaged with, the, with them, so the results from these projects haven't been incorporated into management planning. The strong shortcomings in some of the interpretation that's been presented to the public, we've known about this for 10 years. I did a review, I published the paper uh, in 2008, so they all they know about that. And they still lack in-house cultural heritage or archaeological specialism. They don't have an archaeologist or cultural heritage specialist. They claim that this, is due to vac this vacancy is due to financial constraints. But this is a claim that has been made since the 1990s. So some of the concerns, and I'll come back to that, some of the concerns is the absence of an up-to-date management plan, which I'm told is in process. It's also unclear whether AMAFA, the heritage agency which has supported them, certainly through this memorandum of understanding, is going to be able to provide the same level of support going forward. AMAFA itself is, uh, as I've mentioned there, they've had cuts to their budget. But also, there's a new bill, which is called the kwazulu natal Mafa Research Institute Bill, which is likely to see a reorientating of the organization, a restructuring and a reorientating. And it's unlikely that they're going to be able to put the same level of resource into supporting the management of the rock art in the Ukaklamba Drakensberg. And Ezenvelu, a concern remains, Ezenvelu's continued lack of cultural heritage expertise. We have a long history of trying to con uh, convince the Natal Parks Board first and then SM Velo to create a, uh, a post. This goes back to the 1990s. They included it in the organogram, but it was unfunded, so it was never implemented. There was an attempt in 2003 to get one, but then uh, local politics in uh, got involved and the MAFA chairperson dissuaded them from doing that, which I think was wrong. They should have done it, but that it could itself be a subject of a talk. Um, so why the lack of commitment to appoint a man cultural management staff and to properly exercise uh, responsibility to safeguard cultural heritage? So why is it that there's this favoring of natural heritage over cultural heritage? Now at an international level, a man called Griffiths, and I think this applies to South Africa, commented in 1991 that the growing dominance of ecological principle in landscape evaluation from the mid-19th century has introduced a biocentric rather than anthropocentric focus to park management. And this is so, it's not really uh, unique to SM Velo and until Parks Board, it's, it's uh, one of its predecessors. The wilderness concept, which is prevalent uh, in, certainly in SM Velo, it was introduced to the Natal Parks Board in the 1950s. And again, if I refer back to Griffiths, he speaks about it. He says, the human became the intruder in the national park landscape, or wilderness, as these areas were increasingly called. And then Malcolm Draper, a South African sociologist in 2003, commented that the association between wilderness and the colonial preservationist mindset seeking, you know, sought to alienate indigenous people from nature, both intellectually and materially. And he says... It's more complex than the MPB, but that is in the Natal Parks Board, but that really was the, the net effect of, of some of the ideas. And then you've got to throw apartheid into the mix. So we have a colonial pre preservation mindset uh, with a wilderness concept, the biocentric focus, 
in park management, and then we have apartheid. Now, I haven't looked specifically at the history of uh, Natal Parks Board, or, uh, which has been around since the late 40s, um, but we, uh, with a colleague in the 1980s, we looked at museums, and we saw that it was very much focused on, on white settlers in the museums with very little uh, appreciation of the pre-colonial African history. And we commented to admit the existence of the pre-colonial histories, to admit the existence of pre-colonial popu African population, and to raise a host of uncomfortable questions about what happened to it in the colonial context. And that would apply to the hunter-gatherers in the in the Oka drakensberg Mountains. And I think it has, uh, you know, it has implications for conservation because certainly the, there would be an ideological uh, sort of. Uh, common thought between some of the people who were working in the museums and the folk who were running the Tell Parks Board and later is in Velo. Where does that leave us today? I appreciate that things have changed quite significantly since 1994, since uh, the first democratic elections in South Africa. But I think to a large degree we're still living with the legacy and the ideologies and the value systems which influenced the Tell Parks Board, the MPB, and as in Velo to favor nature over culture. And I think to a large degree it explains why there still isn't in-house cultural heritage managed capacity in as in Velo. So to wrap up, it's, a, it's an incredible her heritage. It really is sublime. The paintings uh, are among the best in the world, or I, I would argue the best in the world, but then I have rock art colleagues from all over the world arguing that theirs is the best, but I know that this is the best. Um, a large amount of work has been done by the Tell Parks Board, uh, sorry, by non Ezenbello and Parks Board people and organizations. Um, they might not be able to sustain that work going into the future. Ezenbello lacks in house cultural management capacity, which is a major concern. And I think in, in many ways we still, even though the personnel have changed, and the people of color running these organizations, we still have some of the legacy from the past in terms of the ideology and the value systems uh, that, uh, that are guiding the organizations. I think it is beginning to change, but that's happening very slowly. And an irony is, is that the man called George Hughes, who was the CEO, the last CEO of Natal Parks Board, and the first CEO is in Velo, he wrote in 1964, he did a bit of rock art recording in the middle part of the Kaflamba Drakensberg, and he said, it may be useful to have a catalogue of all the paintings in the reserve. In a few years' time, it may be possible to show someone just how many paintings are disappearing because of neglect, and to shock him into trying to do something. The fights that I had with that man to try and get them <laughs> to implement a policy where they actually valued the rock art to, such, to a point where they appointed someone um, who, who had a his primary responsibility was to look after it. Were just, there were just so many of them, and they were quite acrimonious. I should send that quote to him. I didn't have it at the time. Someone gave it to me afterwards. I should send that to him now. Thank you very much. <laughs>